morning, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, welcome to this new uh, web webinar, Geo Solutions webinar, as part of the free webinar series that we have been doing almost for two years. I'm going to give uh, one or two minutes for other folks to join. Uh, it's 11. Uh, so we'll give you just one or two minutes and then and then we'll start. I hope you all are enjoying the, the, the beautiful weather. Uh, here in Maryland, we have a special phenomena going on. It's called cicadas, where there are these little bugs that appear every 17 years and they provide like a humming of like thousands of them. So we're going to have that for two months. So if you are in Maryland or the East Coast, um, enjoy that beautiful sound from nature. Uh, just a reminder that uh, there are various ways to to participate in this webinar. Uh, there is a chat, but it also there is a Q&A. So please put all your questions in the Q&A. Uh, that is the way that we prefer for us to capture the questions and then we will respond in the order that uh, have been asked. We're going to start first with uh, an introduction about your solutions, and then we're going to go into the details provided by our DevOps, Alessandro Parma, uh, Simone Gaginiki, who is the founder of, of uh, Geo Solutions. I'm going to get started. Um, so again, welcome everybody. So these are the topics that we're going to cover today. Uh, you will see that we're going to talk a little bit about your server. And then we're going to walk through some data and scenarios where it provides the context uh, for you to understand what we're going to talk about how to deploy your server. Then we're going through some common mistakes because that's usually what we see, um, what we learn from a lot of our customers. They repeatedly do some, follow some patterns that are not okay. We're going to provide some real world use cases and then some conclusions and next steps for you to follow if you want to do a proper uh, user server. Um, cluster development. So about us, we are the world leader in development and maintenance and open source enterprise software for geospatial information management. Uh, we were founded in 2006 and we opened offices in Italy last year. And we have customers um, around the world. We support four main products, GeoServer, MapStore, GeoNode, and GeoNetwork, but also uh, other software that is behind the software. For example, uh, your web cache and uh, you know, PostGIS, we provide some support related to how it connects to your server and your node and such. And also the plugins that are behind your server. And we provide uh, different ways that you can, um, or we can collaborate with you to advance your solution or to support you. And one is enterprise support services where you purchase a certain number of hours and then we provide support depending on any issue that you have. So there is a ticket portal, you provide an issue, and then you know, we, we fix it, we investigate it, and, and so on and so forth. Deployment subscription. So once you have a, for example, user server installed or geo node, you just want to have a guarantee that if something fails, it will be fixed. So it's a, a subscription based on number of issues that can be covered over the year. We also can provide customized solutions if you want like a, a web application with some particular menu and some kind of functionality, some kind of processes that are activated via a click of a button, etc. We provide those mostly based on, on Map Store. And we also provide professional training where we do to companies or we do like here in free webinars, post 4 g meetings and other uh, venues as well. We have more than 200 clients around the world, and these are from um, international organizations like the UN, the World Bank, uh, WFP, and we have uh, UNESCO and so on. We, we also have a big uh, private <clears throat> customers that are having that are providing their backend and infrastructure with your server to provide you know, millions of data, for example, like Digital Globe and others that um, uses our infrastructure and our expertise to, to scale their solution. And we cover uh, different industries. Um, 
not going to go into more detail. And uh, we strongly part, uh, support open source. So we participate in various uh, as, as board uh, steering committee uh, positions. We are OGC members and constantly being funded by the OGC Innovation Program. And we also support USDIF, we are members, and uh, we participate in JOINT. We're going to be at the JOINT conference this year as well with a booth. We have the lead developers, and I think that's the main difference of us and other companies, that we have the lead developers of core software that, uh, that, are, that is used in the open source GIS environment. So we have experience with uh, providing raster data, vector data, special uh, databases, not only post GIS, but others that can connect nicely to your server. Um, we have also extensive experience in WebGIS applications. So maps or um, you can configure it, for example, to use system only fleet, um, but we also have expertise in, in other technologies. Um, of course, we have experience in OGC protocols because open source, the nature of open source is not be, going to be able to connect with other software using international standards. So um, it's very important for us. And we have experience in performance and scalability, which we're going to talk about it today. And as I showed before, we have a lot of industry experience. You can visit our portfolio page in our website where there is a lot of information related to that. We're about uh, 30 uh, people right now around the world. And as you see, we are uh, core members of various software uh, tools. Uh, I was part of OGC uh, about for 10 years. So I'm very familiar with OGC standards and the compliance program. That's why I like very much Geo Solutions because they were doing it uh, in, in a good way. And um, yeah, you see we have Kitty members. Now I'm going to hand these to um, Alessandro or Simone? Alessandro. Okay, Alessandro. Okay, so if you want to share your screen, I will stop sharing. Thank you. Thanks, Luis. Again, just a reminder. So if, if we have questions, please put them in the Q&A and we will answer those questions as, as in the order they appear. Thank you. All right. Can you see my screen? OK. Uh, so thanks, everyone, for attending. I'm uh, Alessandro Parma, uh, DevOps engineer at Geosolutions. Um, let's start from the from the beginning. So, what is GeoServer? GeoServer is a, a geospatial enterprise gateway. It's a Java-based application. It's an open source application, actually, uh, for sharing geospatial data. Uh, at its core, it's designed for interoperability, and um, it's able to it's compliant with um, all of the main uh, um, standards uh, as listed here. And uh, it's able to work with um, many, many different um, data sources. All the major data sources are supported in GeoServer, as we can see. Um, so either vector, vector data sources or raster data sources, most of them are supported in GeoServer. And you're able to, to publish this data uh, to the end users using uh, GeoServer. In order to speak about um, uh, deployments and uh, best practices, uh, we start first by defining what's uh, a good deployment. So how do we define uh, a good deployment? We have um, a few ways to measure it. Um, a good deployment should be scalable, meaning that it should be able to uh, accommodate um, more and more user requests um, by uh, adding more hardware resources without code refactoring. So you shouldn't need to uh, change the software in order to be able to scale it and withstand more load in your application. It should be robust, so uh, it shouldn't um, you shouldn't experience um, downtimes, frequent downtimes, and it shouldn't uh, 
need um, frequent intervention in order to, to be able to keep up with the work. So it should be performant as well. Uh, what do we mean? Uh, your maps should be low, um, loading uh, fast. So you don't, and no one likes to wait for the, the maps to load and your uh, deployment should be able to keep up with the load and um, respond in a quick manner. It should be maintainable as well in terms of adding data, upgrading components, changing the configuration of, uh, of your software. It should be relatively straightforward and uh, where possible, it should be automated as well. Um, another desirable feature of a, of a good deployment is for it to be observable. Uh, what does it mean? It means uh, we need to be able to understand uh, what went wrong if, if something uh, went wrong. And uh, we should be able to uh, gain some insights in order, in order to fix the system in a quickly manner. There are other ways to measure a good deployment. Um, ideally, it should be repeatable. So you should be able to deploy your system multiple times over time. And uh, you should be able to um, deploy it in various environments, ideally with uh, uh, no change. Uh, and yeah, and there are other metrics as well. So in real world scenarios, um, if you never have problems uh, with your services, it means that nobody's using it. So by experience, um, we tell you that if a system is uh, heavily used, then you will uh, from time to time experience some issues. So you need to be prepared for it. What does it mean to be prepared? Uh, you should set up a staging environment, uh, a representative staging environment with um, close or ideally uh, equal hardware resources to the production environment. And it should resemble the production environment as closely as possible in every way. So that if something goes wrong, um, you can reproduce it in your staging environment and work in the staging environment instead of production. You should set up um, monitoring and logging for both the infrastructure and your services in order to understand what's going on. So you can uh, uh, intervene in a quickly manner. And you should also set up uh, analytics and metering in order to understand how the system is performing and how the end users are using the system and uh, take actions um, based on that. Setting alerts, of course, is a good idea. So you, you get notified in advance. Uh, setting watch up, uh, set up watchdogs. So watchdogs are um, uh, small demons uh, checking the services that can uh, intervene and eventually try to fix them uh, if something goes wrong. So say um, a crash of your application, uh, a watchdog could, for instance, restart the application. And you should set up um, troubleshooting tools and procedures so that you have the tools that you need um, to debug uh, the system. An example of that would be, for, especially for GeoServer, would be um, having uh, JSTAC and JMAP installed on your, on your system so that you're able to, to get um, uh, stacks and uh, memory dumps from GeoServer. Be proactive. So you should run um, periodic uh, preventive checks on the system. Uh, take a look around, uh, check your audits, audit files, for instance, look for any um, outstanding situation, any error, uh, 
um, and also uh, check your system overall, of course. Um, look for any potential um, issue with the services and the infrastructure. You can set up automated or uh, manual load tests. Uh, we have uh, example of those in uh, G-Solutions training pages if you're interested. Uh, we use JMeter specifically for this kind of work. And uh, keep that technical depth under control. So you should uh, keep up with the up, mm, new technologies uh, as they come up. So be diligent, document everything, automate it as much as possible. Uh, every time you make a change to the infrastructure or the application, take note of that. If any problem come up later on, um, you're always able to come back to your log and check what you did and uh, find out if there is something that um, may have caused it. Automate as, as much as possible, of course, that's to eliminate human error, which is the most frequent cause of errors in these kind of systems. And uh, as we said, monitor everything. And be brave. So when needed, uh, you need to, to get your hands dirty and um, check the production system, for instance, directly. Um, in order to fix or find any, any, any bugs. That's not recommended, of course, but from time to time, you need to do that. There's a deployment checklist that we've come up with um, to help you out with planning your uh, uh, infrastructure. So um, at the very beginning, you should analyze your data. What does it mean? So you should look at your data uh, in terms of size, in terms of structure, uh, data formats, whether it's uh, raster or, or, or vector data, whether it's if it's compressed or not, and so on and so on. Uh, you should analyze your use cases and uh, scenarios. So try to understand what the end users uh, are interested in and um, try to foresee, for instance, how they're going to access the data published in your system, what application they're going to use, and so on. And then study and analyze geoservice strengths and limitations. Uh, so you, you may be choosing um, one uh, uh, data format instead of another, for instance, based on the performance uh, that you GeoServer can uh, deliver with that specific uh, data formats. Uh, prepare a deployment plan. That's what we um, we're going to help you with today. So we're going to give you the tools in order to allow you to prepare your your deployment plan. And of course, this is um, this is something you need to. Uh, review periodically. So it's uh, like uh, um, a checklist that you should uh, come back to later on and then repeat over time in order to perfect and improve your uh, infrastructure. Some key facts from GeoServer. So if you don't know already, uh, GeoServer config configuration is stored in what is called uh, the data directory. So data directory uh, is not super intuitive, but it doesn't, it's not meant to store the data. So it's meant to store uh, geoservice configuration. And the structure of the data directory is a hierarchy of uh, directories and files. Um, this data directory is then loaded up in memory by GeoServer at startup time to be more efficient and more performant. And um, it's not automatically um, reloaded over time. So if you make a change to the files uh, on your file system or whatever 
um, data store you have, your server is not going to figure that out automatically. You need to reload uh, your configuration or instead of making the change directly uh, to the files on the file system, you can use uh, the REST API of GeoServer to apply this change for you. This way, uh, the catalog, so the GeoServer configuration doesn't need to be reloaded. Configuration reloading, so the operation of uh, reloading the configuration from file doesn't break the OGC services, so there's no service interruption for your customers. Um, but cust uh, configuration reloading blocks the GeoServer UI and the REST API. So it's a blocking operation. If you have um, ongoing um, scripts or services interacting with the REST API, they're going to be blocked until the operation is completed. And you will not be able to make any changes to the configuration from the user interface until the catalog reloading is completed. Global configuration locks. The catalog uh, is not thread safe. So this configuration that is loaded in memory is not thread safe. What does it mean? It cannot be uh, changed by multiple threads. Uh, oh, Alessandro, at the time. just one quick thing. When you say catalog, just to be clear, we called the internal configuration, the in-memory configuration holder in GeoServer the catalog. So this is not related to catalog services or CSW. I mean, the model that inside GeoServer handles the information, the configuration for the data and everything, it's called catalog. So sometimes when we say GeoServer catalog, it means the parts of GeoServer that handle the configuration, okay? Thank you. Um, so yes, it cannot be uh, changed by multiple processes at the same time. Um, and as we said, in order to, to, um, to make configuration changes, uh, you can use the REST API of a GeoServer. Um, the OGC requests instead can go in parallel. So the, the user facing services can be accessed and should be accessed by multiple users and multiple services at the same time. Uh, that's how they are designed to work and uh, that's how that you should be using them. So in order to um, avoid uh, uh, long operations on, um, on the catalog, uh, blocking operation on the catalog, you should move those operation operations from outside of configuration changes. So for instance, you can upload your data in advance and then make the configuration change in GeoServer so that the configuration changes is fast uh, in order to avoid that. Other strengths and limitations of GeoServer. Um, so, um, the default Java ops and configuration. You, you must tune your Java ops uh, for the Java virtual machine in order to for GeoServer to work properly. It's uh, by default is going to start with a poorly configured set of Java ops and it won't be performing as well as it should, or it can even uh, uh, not start at all with def default configuration. Another thing to check is your JNDI resources and um, connection pools, they must be configured properly. And there are guidelines in the GeoServer documentation on how to configure the JNDI resources and connection pools properly in terms of how many uh, open connections to set, uh, what timeouts to set and so on. Other things to pay attention to are resource limits. These define uh, the maximum amount of resources 
uh, that services can use in GeoServer. For instance, uh, the maximum uh, memory allowed for tile rendering, and that's just an example, or um, uh, the timeouts for the tile rendering. That's another example. Control flow uh, should be installed and configured properly. Control flow is a GeoServer extension. We always install it in all of our deployments. Control flow is uh, kind of um, um, traffic uh, limiting or throttling service for GeoServer, uh, where you can tune the, the amount of uh, requests that are allowed to reach GeoServer in parallel. False myths about GeoServer. So GeoServer needs a lot of memory. That's a false myth. Uh, by our experience, our reference dimensioning for uh, the GeoServer heap is two to four gigabytes of RAM. Unless you have a very large uh, catalog uh, in terms of how many layers you have published in your GeoServer, uh, four gigabytes should be more than enough. Another example is um, unless you, you generate large PDF prints or, uh, or um, PNG maps, you definitely don't need more than four gigabytes of RAM. And unless you have many, many CPUs available for your GeoServer instance, you don't need for more than four gigabytes of RAM. Another false myth, a GeoServer is slow. So most of the time, if and when uh, your GeoServer instance is slow, it doesn't depend on GeoServer itself. It's often the case that the data that you're publishing in GeoServer is not processed correctly or the styles that you have associated with your layers are not defined properly to be um, efficient and performant in GeoServer. Another reason for a slow GeoServer instance would be you're trying to uh, render a huge uh, amount of uh, data from a, from, a, from a data source or um, you're running a non-optimized uh, container, like for instance, the cross-platform binary, which is based on Jetty. You cannot expect um, terrific performance from a, from a machine with a few CPU cores, uh, you cannot expect uh, great performance from a machine or a system where you're not using caching and you have few CPU cores. That's another typical, typical case. Or um, another, another case of um, a slow GeoServer instance would be if you have uh, many, many layers. So this means more than 50,000 or and so on. Uh, the startup times and the reload times of your Azure server can, uh, can grow significantly as well as your um, memory heap size. Another issue with serving a large amount of layers would be the get capabilities document, which becomes bloated and slow to render and to read by client applications. Uh, of course, all the layers are listed in there. So the more layers you add, the more it grows. In these scenarios, uh, where you have many, many layers published in your server, you can um, leverage partitioning via virtual services, uh, which would map to the concept of workspaces in your server. So you can have workspace specific get capabilities documents. This way you partition the number of layers uh, by, by your workspaces. Another approach would be sharding on different instances where 
you dedicate some GeoServer instances to specific set of layers. So you don't have all the layers published in all of your GeoServers. But some uh, handle a specific set of layers and others handle other set of layers. And then you can um, route the traffic properly um, at your proxy level. That's, a, that's another option. Additional resources, we have uh, a webinar uh, that we recorded previously. If you haven't, uh, if you didn't attend to it, it's available uh, in the link in the slides, which covers several uh, topics about how to um, have a performant GeoServer instance, like um, input data preparation, styling optimizations, uh, JVM options, and so on. Other topics uh, that we're not going to cover today because they have been uh, covered um, already are the um, clustering, uh, um, active clustering set up in GeoSub. Containers and GeoServer. GeoServer can be containerized. Sorry, can... sorry, Alessandro. Can you go back one slide? Yeah. Just to be clear here, we did another webinar based on what we usually, the presentation we usually do at the Phosphor-G, which is the GeoServer in production, and that covers the basic. Uh, it gives us like precondition of what we're going to talk from now on, which is more based on uh, DevOps and deployment, if you want. Uh, we decided to focus for this moment, uh, for this webinar, only on the standard GeoServer, so we won't cover active clustering, but we will do a separate webinar for that because it would be otherwise too big. And actually, I think Alessandro, we need to speed up a little bit because we have a lot of material to cover. So if there are uh, concepts that you don't understand them, the other points that we see the other slides, you can have a look at the... Uh, um, at the previous webinar, I put the link there. There is the recording, there is the slides, and it points to our material. So as Alessandro said, that covers things like uh, data optimization, styling optimization, JVM optimizations, resource limits, the control flow. It's more about optimizing the instance. So you make sure you squeeze whatever you could squeeze out the GeoServer as is before you start looking into clustering, high availability, et cetera, et cetera, okay? So, you can review that uh, webinar and we will have another webinar specifically for the uh, active clustering solutions and so on. Go ahead, Alessandro. Okay, thanks. So containers and GeoServer. Um, if you wonder whether or not GeoServer can be containerized, yes, it can. So there are, um, several implementations available out there, especially for Docker-based containers. We have um, our own implementation, it's linked in the slides, and there is also an official Docker image for GeoServer, which is coming uh, up soon. Advantages of using Docker containers or the, um, uh, instead of virtual uh, machines, for instance, we did some of the work for you. So the Docker images are kind of uh, already optimized in, a, in, in some ways. So uh, the Java ops tuning, that's something you don't need to do yourself. For instance, uh, directories externalizations, that's another thing that we have done for you in advance. Um, in some of the images, you have a predefined set of uh, plugins that are useful and, and needed in, in our view for production deployments, like the control flow extension that we were talking about before. Um, other advantages of using Docker containers or um, instead of virtual machines are the flexibility and portability and uh, of this kind of setup. So you're, you're free to uh, port your containers from one environment to another, 
without making uh, any any significant changes to them or probably no changes at all uh, you can run them on windows or linux interchangeably and so on they're flexible in the sense that um, due to how the containers are implemented it's generally speaking easier to scale uh, your deployments in and out when they're deployed using um, uh, containers and it's definitely more repeatable so all the setup of the requirements and so on the application containers the jdk is already done and it's in uh, defined inside of the docker image itself um, you don't have to do the same steps again so it's more repeatable another advantage is orchestrators can help you out orchestrators like uh, docker compose swarm kubernetes and so on they can help you out in many ways with the deployment itself the containers the upgrade process you can uh, for instance typically upgrade and roll back if you're not happy about your upgrades you can monitor your deployments uh, at the container level and so on these advantages of course they require some prior knowledge so you have to have some knowledge about uh, docker itself um, and the technologies um, around around docker and uh, debugging can be a headache when you're using docker containers so it's it's much harder typically to debug issues um, in a cluster when you're using docker containers it's hard to find uh, where the issue is maybe you have a, a faulty uh server instance you need to find out which one it is and so on So what to store in the Docker images? Um, a typical use case is you store requirements and code in your Docker images. So you have your uh, JDK, Apache Tomcat, and your web app application burned into the Docker image, and that's it. And you keep the configuration, so the data there, um, deployed in um, in a, in a shared volume, for instance, and you don't put it in the container itself. That's the typical use case. Um, another way would be burning the configuration directly in the Docker images. And that's something we, we do ourselves in some scenarios where, where it fits um, the requirements. And we will look at it later on. Uh, maybe data is not uh, recommended, so you don't want to bloat your Docker images with uh, with raster or vector data. Uh, they will be harder to move around and uh, schedule on your nodes. You have to monitor your containers, of course. Uh, as we said, it's harder to debug things and and understand what's going on in your cluster when using containers. So it's recommended that you centralize your logging and you have um, a place to look at where you want to find out what's going on um, you need to parameterize things like file paths for instance in order to avoid clashing between uh, between the pods uh, typical example would be the juice of the logs that uh, log file you put it in a shared volume and then all of the containers come up and they want to write to the same file. So uh, that wouldn't work. That would throw an error. Um, you need to parameterize these things. Another thing to pay attention to, of course, is sharing of files and directory is not implicit with Docker. That's what containers are meant to do. So they're meant to isolate applications from one another. So you have to explicitly state that you want to share, for instance, the GeoServer configuration or the raster data directory and so on. Um, to help you out with debugging, uh, you can decide to log to standard out 
that's something uh, some of our clients uh, do. Instead of logging to file, they decide to log to standard outputs and then use the um, uh, features in, in their orchestrators to, to retrieve these logs and uh, centralize them in uh, whatever way they want. Another typical problem is file permissions. So check your user IDs. Um, the users um, that belong to the hosting system, they're not the same as in the container. So you have to match the user IDs of the user that is running in the container with the one on the host in order for uh, GeoServer to be able to access the files and directories that it needs. Okay, another thing um, we want to look at is how to make a portable configuration. Uh, what does it mean? It's a configuration that can be moved from one environment to another. If you look at the data directory, for instance, there are some uh, environment specific references by default, and we want to eliminate them as much as possible. Examples of this would be uh, disk quota configuration. So the disk quota would, if you do things properly, contain a URL to pointing to a database, an external database for the disk quota metadata. And that's likely going to be environment specific. So if you move the configuration, say, from development to production, you will have a, a problem. Another example would be uh, control flow configuration. If you tuned your control flow for uh, uh, a test environment, does not necessarily uh, match the configuration that you want for your production environment. Geofence um, data source that's similar to what we have said for, for the disk quota. So it's going to have a reference to, to, to a database and uh, you don't um, want to have it in your data directory hard coded because otherwise it's not going to work when you, when you migrate the data directory. Other things, maybe if you're using an uh, a database for users authorization uh, can be environment specific. DNS, if you have control over the DNS service in your environments, it can help, of course, to, to, to mitigate these problems because you can, for instance, resolve the same URLs to different IP addresses according to environment. Um, but there are other better approaches to the problem. One would be um, a parameterization of your configuration. So there's a feature in GeoServer that you can uh, enable in order to allow you to use um, environment variables in your configuration. That way you externalize um, the uh, environment specific properties to environment variables, or actually not, not just environment variables, but also a properties file, um, which lives outside of the data directory. And that's uh, how you, you solve uh, the problem. Another thing uh, to look at when you want to migrate the configuration between environment is uh, the backup and uh, restore plugin. It's a, a plugin for GeoServer that allows you to uh, basically dump and uh, restore uh, part of or all of your configuration um, between uh, GeoServer instances. You can, for instance, filter out by layer or by workspace. You have a dry run option to check and make sure that there are no um, errors or issues with, your, uh, with the migration of the configuration. Uh, and it's um, experimental, but it's getting, it's getting mature over time. It's relatively safe uh, in the sense that um, 
um, in case of errors during the restore procedure, the backup and restore plugin is not going to um, to switch your your server configuration to the new one. So it's going to stop there, and uh, and um, you'll have to intervene to to, to move on. So multi-environment deployments, why would you want to uh, set up multiple environments? It's a waste of resources in a sense, not really, it depends. So a, reason, a good reason to set up multiple environments would be to allow you to test and prototype things without impacting the end users, of course. So if you have a development environment, uh, you can do whatever you want without uh, breaking the services or the maps that are user facing. You can test code changes, for instance, uh, GeoServer upgrades. Uh, it wouldn't be nice to perform an upgrade directly in production. So it's better to have uh, multiple environments to allow you to, to test this in advance. Internet versus internet facing services. That's some that's um, something that some of our clients do. So they have um, multiple environments. One is used internally uh, by people employed at a given company. And um, the other environment is user facing and maybe has more strict rules in terms of um, users' authorizations and um, data security. So they, they're not allowed to do whatever they want with the data. Uh, another reason would be allow multiple teams to work in parallel. So as we, as we said before, the GeoServer configuration and uh, the GeoServer catalog, uh, which is the configuration loaded in, in, in memory, is not really meant to be uh, written by multiple processes or users at the same time. So it's not meant to be edited by multiple people at the same time. By setting up multiple environments, each um, team can work on its own GeoServer instance independently and then um, move forward and, uh, and merge their work uh, um, in, in the destination environments. How would you set up um, multiple environments? Uh, you definitely want to implement some automation uh, to help you out with the migration. So uh, pipelines, uh, generally speaking, that help you to move things forward from one environment to, to the other to avoid uh, human errors. You should make your data directory portable, of course, as, as we said in the previous slide. Um, using containers help uh, making the process easier. So if you're using um, Docker containers and you're storing uh, the configuration in, in your Docker images, it becomes very easy to, to move uh, the configuration from one environment to another. It's just a matter of deploying the new Docker image. And you can Sandra, use... Uh, can you hear me? Yeah. Uh, sorry to bother. Can you show? Because I always noted that the documentation is not super clear about the parameterization of the data directory. Can you show the link I gave you and explain one second what that means? The police is not looking for me, if you're wondering. <sighs> Yeah, just a sec. Okay. So that's the link um, to the GeoServer documentation on how to parameterize. Yeah, but by the way, here you see that thing I said before, biting us again. We call the catalog, uh, the internal catalog somehow. Internally, we also identify that with the data directory because I mean the data directory is actually a snapshot of the internal catalog at a certain point because if you remember what we said when you have a stats load the configuration from the data directory memory and it keeps it it pins it in what we call the, the internal catalog 
So probably we should rename this and say parameterize the data directory links or whatever, because it's a little bit unclear. But anyway, back to you, Alessandro. Yeah, so this is how you would enable it, the feature, uh, the parameterization of the environments. Uh, you can set this option in the in your Java ops and you're good to go. From there, you can use um, a file called uh, GeoServer Environment Properties. Uh, if you put it in your data layer um, to parameterize um, the, the data directory, or as we said, uh, environment variables. And then in your in your GeoServer configuration, you can use these properties um, with placeholders like this one. That's just an example. So these values would be replaced at runtime with the property that you set or the environment variable that you set. That's how it works. And that's how it would look like from the GeoServer UI. This is uh, a parameterized store URL. Okay, um, so yeah, multiple environments. We said uh, why you would do that and how to do that. Um, you can use backup and restore, uh, as we said before, to migrate things from one environment to the other. About clustering, uh, we mentioned a GeoServer cluster. Uh, why would you set up a GeoServer cluster instead of having a a single GeoServer instance. After all, it's harder to maintain and harder to operate compared to a single GeoServer instance. So why would you do that? Um, there are multiple reasons. Scalability and high availability are the most um, relevant ones. So you can scale out uh, your, your cluster, meaning, um, that you can set up more GeoServer instances in order to uh, obtain better performance and uh, um, robustness of your service. Uh, what does it mean to scale out? It means just running more um, instances uh, of GeoServer at the same time. It's uh, very common in elastic computing environments where you have uh, a dynamic uh, uh, pool of resources available to you. So you can, for instance, uh, have, a, have multiple uh, nodes or multiple virtual machines uh, on demand. So that's a typical uh, scenario. And you can have auto-scaling as well. So you can uh, have procedure that's, procedures that scale out your cluster or in your cluster based on uh, the load and various metrics in order to, uh, to be able to, to withstand uh, the load on the system, but without wasting resources. So when the demand of resources uh, increases, uh, the, the, the cluster scales out uh, when it increases. When it decreases, it scales it back in, so you don't waste uh, money. Another approach would be scaling up, which means adding more GeoServer, more uh, resources to, to, your, um, to the single machine or to your instance. Uh, that uh, can be, of course, um, not, not efficient compared to what we, we have said before, and it works up to a point. So uh, you, you can scale up your, uh, your machine, add, the, add more resources, you will see a benefit in terms of performance up to a level, and then other things will, um, will be limiting your performance. Uh, typically, um, IO uh, bandwidth or uh, IOPS uh, would be a limitation. Or you can eventually uh, end up hitting a, a bottleneck in the, in the, in the GeoServer code. That's another thing that can happen. That's why it's 
typically preferable to scale out rather than scaling up. Okay. Um, yeah, as we said, scaling up means uh, more powerful hardware. Uh, there's no auto scaling, so it's easier. And you typically size your um, your machine your machines based on the largest uh, expected load, and that's why it can be more expensive. Um, with scaling out of your instances, instead you have many many smaller just over instances, and uh, they can be scaled uh, dynamically in uh, in an auto scaling fashion, and it's uh, more efficient. Clustering paradigms. So when you scale your cluster, then um, you will face the problem of how to propagate configuration changes from one instance to the others. As we said, um, the just of the configuration. One quick thing, one quick thing, Alessandro. Uh, if you go back, if you remember what we said, when GeoServer starts, the default GeoServer loads the configuration in memory. There is no capability to, let's say, watch the data directory and update the configuration, you need to do a manual reload. You can do that via the Google, via the REST interface. So when you start clustering, which means you put more instances in parallel one way or the other, what you're doing, you are actually going to share the data. We'll see that in a bit. Share the data, share the data directory, okay? Which means sharing the configuration. So if you make a change to one of the instances, the other instance will not see the change unless you force a reload. This is what we call passive clustering. Passive meaning that GeoServer instances doesn't know that they are part of a cluster. It's uh, the infrastructure that you put around it that makes it work in a clustering. And this is, I mean, that the most common use case. Active clustering, when GeoServer is actually somehow uh, aware that is in a cluster. And these usually entails putting together message passing uh, technologies that exchange messages within the instances one way or the other, or they, let's say, externalize the status and the status is shared and kept in, and kept in sync between the different instances. So one way or the other, either you, you're actually, let's put it this way, sharing the internal catalog one way or the other, either you keep it in sync via messages or you externalize it and you put it somewhere like a Redis or anything like that, and you and you uh, tap into it every time. So this is what we call optic clustering. As we said before, we'll focus on this in a in a separate webinar because it's a relatively large topic where we have multiple things to to look at and and compare. Sorry, Alessandro. What? Okay. Um, so yes, uh, there are multiple layouts that you can use for your clustering, multiple setups that you can use for your clustering. We differentiate between active-active clustering where all of the instances are participating to um, serving requests to the end users. And um, sorry, that's active-active and active-passive where some of the instances, one or more are dormant and they are, um, uh, used only in case they're needed. So as a failover, for instance, say there's a problem with the, one of the main instances, then as a failover, uh, one of the dormant is, is um, joining uh, the load balancing and then it becomes uh, active. A typical uh, setup is a back, of, back office production. Uh, where you have a dedicated back office instance to manage the GeoServer configuration. You make changes to this uh, instance via the user interface or the REST interface. And um, the production instances instead are um, end user facing and they're used for data serving. Uh, this can uh, easily scale 
horizontally, so you can add more um, more slave uh, or production instances uh, as you want. And um, the 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 promotion, what we call the promotion, so the propagation of uh, the configuration changes from the back office to the slaves is um, manually triggered and automated in some way, typically again using a, a pipeline. So you trigger a pipeline, uh, the configuration that you have in your back office is ported over to the, to the slaves and the sl slaves are reloaded in order to pick up the new data directory or the new configuration. Okay, takeaways from this section. Uh, the configuration is stored in the data directory. Uh, the configuration is loaded in memory at startup. Uh, any change to the files is not picked up automatically. Uh, GeoServer GUI doesn't work well uh, behind a, a load balancer, so it's not really meant to be used um, through a load balancer, but you should have a dedicated instance to manage uh, the, the configuration, so a back office instance. If you have many uh, layers, uh, the startup time can be slow. Uh, and yes. Yeah, we should probably add another zero there because on average 10 k yeah. is not that much any longer. It's not that much. No. Okay. As Simone said before, there's um, another approach uh, to clustering and to manage the configuration in a cluster, which is the active, active clustering, which we're not going to cover today. We're going to focus on the back passive clustering, uh, which is fitting most use cases. And we will look at some of them later on. GeoServer in the cloud. So GeoServer itself, it's not uh, cloud native. It's a uh, relatively, relatively uh, mature uh, or old uh, software. It's not uh, born in the in the cloud era. Nobody but likes to be called old, Alessandro. Uh, mature. Let's say it sounds better. <laughs> um, but it's cloud ready, so it works. Uh, perfectly fine uh, with any uh, any cloud provider uh, in containerized environment uh, with most uh, actually all known uh, orchestrators and it can auto scale easily as we as we said before so it's there's no really limitation in in using uh, geoserver in the cloud um, there's support for object storage uh, in GeoServer for various things, uh, for instance, style caching and um, cloud optimized GeoTIFFs, so raster data. So you can use that if it fits your, your, your use case. Storing uh, tile, uh, the tile cache in, in an object store has the advantage of scaling very well. So of course it's it's a bit counterintuitive because when you work with caches, you typically want them to be uh, super fast and with a very low latency. Uh, with object storage, you sacrifice a bit in terms of latency, but what you get is a very good scalability. So you can serve many many uh, tiles from from the cache in parallel without noticing um, a hit in terms of performance. Uh, when you choose your, your instances for, for the GeoServer deployment, try to opt for compute uh, optimized instances. So GeoServer is, uh, likes fast CPUs and, uh, and CPU cores over um, having uh, lots of RAM. As we said at the beginning, typically, four gigabytes of RAM per server instance is more than enough. Like containers, there are many, many implementations available. As we said, there's no real issue with running uh, GeoServer in the container. And when you're using a passive clustering, uh, 
solution. It's very easy to scale uh, in and out your cluster uh, without having any, any problem. Likes automation, so yes, you can use and you should be using uh, some sort of pipeline to uh, to manage, for instance, configuration promotion, as we were looking at before, from back office to production, or to migrate things from one environment to the other. That's definitely recommended, and it works uh, fine. Do you mind if I take over for some slides so accelerate a little bit? That's fine. I keep sharing so it's it's quicker. Uh, there is a question you might want to answer about HJP versus HTTP. OK, move on. Next slide. I'll try to accelerate a little bit. Uh, OK. <clears throat> As we said before, we are assuming that the basic optimization are done. So you did your own work. You reviewed the previous webinar. Data is optimized. Styles are optimized. I mean, you're not trying to render, uh, I mean, 100 million points with a super complex styling. Resource limits are in place, so you put limits on how big requests can be for WMS, for WCS, and so on. Control flow is tuned, so you're not expecting your server to serve in parallel 200 requests with one core, because that's, I mean, going to, to make the, the your server unhappy because the core will be constantly switching between threads. Again, you can review our previous webinar. So you want to cluster. There is a number of questions you need to ask in order to understand what is the best layout and paradigm for you. As we said before, 95% of the time, you don't need active clustering. This is our experience. There are other things that you need to do uh, that will allow you to cluster without having to, to put in place active clustering. Because one way or the other, when you do active clustering, you're adding more moving parts to your deployments and more things that can become a single point of failure, or let's say a source of worrisome, uh, like, uh, I don't know, a, a message uh, passing uh, like uh, ActiveMQ or, or Redis or something like that, okay? So the usual questions are, how frequently does your data change? Um, are the changes additive or not? Like, for example, you are constantly adding new EO data from a current flow. How frequently do you really change your configuration? Adding data per se doesn't mean changing the configuration. Are you adding Earth observation data to an image mosaic? Are you adding position to a database table? That doesn't mean you need to change the configuration if you do things properly. How frequently you create new layers and how quickly do you need to deliver these changes to production? Because even if you do changes to the configuration, doesn't mean they need to be reflected right away in production. Actually, in most use cases, you're not allowed to. You need to go through a formal QA process to make changes in configuration, okay? Next one. So those are things you need to take into account and you need to also to build on top, okay? Metoc, EO, drones, IoT is the usual use case where data is really dynamic, but the configuration is not, if you think about it. Most part of the time, think about Sentinel data, Landsat data, or you have, I mean, IoT sensor or meteorological models. Once you configure the layers as image mosaic with dimension, you're done. You can add data continuously without reloading your server. And this can scale. The configuration can be burned into Docker images, can be made more or less static. You don't need to change the configuration. You can ingest hundreds of terabytes of data a day without a single reload. You can't reload to your server for weeks, actually. Okay. So most part of the time when we saw clients with 100,000 layers or 1 million layers, we have seen clients with millions of layers. It's because they started to throw, they were serving EO data or drones data or something like that. And they started to throw GeoTiffs or other formats that you server creating layers individually instead of organizing things currently. So they ended up with millions of layers where in reality, they had a few time series. They could have done the same with 10 layers, okay, without reloading GeoServer. So this brings me to the next point. Image Mosaic can help a lot to organize your data. So as I said before, data is already optimized, edge server is optimized. Now you need to think about how to structure your data. Most part of the time you can recognize this current harmonized flow of data that comes in regularly, and you can uh, basically model them with image mosaic. 
image mosaic as a REST API that you can, uh, where you can actually manage the data that you are uploading to GeoServe. Let me rephrase that you are configuring in GeoServe. You shouldn't upload the data directly to GeoServe, especially if data is big. You are unnecessarily using CPU cycles there. The data should be placed somewhere in GeoServe, should be told harvest this data or configure this data. That can be done using the Image Mosaic REST API. We should put a link there, Alessandro, if we forgot to do it uh, on the REST API. I'll take a note. Then you can use dimensions on the Image Mosaic. You can use time. If you have drones, you can use, for example, flight UUIDs to recognize different flights. You can use runtime and forecast time for models. You can use elevation. You can use many dimensions at the same time. And then from WMS, WFS, and WCS, you can use SQL filters. You can use the dimension themselves, which are part of the specification. We have been having clients going from 100,000 layers to 12 layers. 12 layers have been years of data, but still 12 layers with time and so on. This is very important. It's important in, because you can cluster it yourself easily. You can scale it up in and out because at that point, you're not every time you publish reloading the configuration. You're actually never doing that unless you add new missions. But I mean, it doesn't happen every day, for example, to happen new data sources, sorry. It doesn't happen every single hour to add a new data source. It's usually a complex process that you do over time in a very controlled fashion. For vector data, you can do something similar. Instead of trying to create hundreds of tables, you can exploit SQL views uh, at the GeoServer layer, parametric SQL views. You can mix this with views at the database level. You can use dimensions as well for WMS and also for vector layers. Can you move on, Alessandro? There should be another point. We tend to use single large tables, especially with the latest PostGIS, but also with Oracle, you can have tables that are huge, like terabytes and terabytes of data. You can use partitioning, you can use indexing, you can use clustering. You can also use sharding, which means physically spreading data over multiple databases in order to keep the performance very good without having to use hundreds of layers. Again, at that point, you ingest that in the database, and you never load the configuration, okay? You can actually scale in and out again very quickly. Uh, I would ask you to wait for the end for some of the questions. Uh, I was trying to answer them right away. Alessandro, if you can answer some of them, go ahead. Okay, otherwise we'll answer them at the end. The point is, if you manage to keep the number of layers to not grow continuously out of control, or if you, keep, if you manage to make the configuration changes part of a uh, controlled process, you basically are treating GeoServer configuration as code and you are delivering configuration changes as code changes. And when you have things like Kubernetes or Elastic Environments, this comes in very nicely because you can basically reload, destroy containers and recreate them. This means a configuration change, but on average, you are not changing the configuration. So you can scale in and out very quickly. All right, Alessandro? Again, this is very, very important. Uh, remember what we said before, people usually start to think, yeah, I need to cluster, I need active clustering. Again, 95% of the time you don't, because one way or the other, when you are building what we call the DAS, a data platform, I mean, a data as a service platform, on average, most part of the time, you have somehow, and we we'll see some example afterwards, a data production process, you have models running, you have, uh, sensor acquiring data in the field, you have uh, earth observation data coming in, you have uh, drones getting the data. So you have what we call data pipelines, okay? 95% of the time they are producing data in a recognizable way. And once you configure them, you don't need to make changes to the configuration. When you do like styling, new sources, et cetera, et cetera, you need to have a strict QA process or for one reason or the other, you just don't want to throw things in production, like you don't throw code in production, right? In this case, we're trying to treat infra, um, sorry, configuration as code. It's the same thing. So you go through a multi-stage environment and these allows you to use passive clustering and scale things very quickly, okay? One way or the other, uh, 
because you have a process, because you can batch changes. For example, I mean, when people come to me and they say, I want to see things in real time. I mean, uh, real time is what I was studying before I started working with GIS. Real time does not exist. Uh, real time means how much I can wait before I see, I do something and I see the result. And this is where you can actually exploit things and you can try to uh, introduce caching, um, avoid active clustering and so on. Can you go ahead, Alessandro? Okay, some common mistakes that you need to be careful about and you need to know. Many, many times we have seen people using the GeoServe uh, uh, cross-platform binary in production. Uh, we do not recommend that, not because we do not recommend using uh, Jetty, it's based on Jetty, just to be clear. I mean, you can use Jetty, but because that it's like a toy that we put together in order to have people quickly stand up GeoServer and do tests. That's also a trade-off that you always have when you produce something that should be enterprise ready. People expect to download something from the web and build a data center that can serve better by dot data. I mean, you can quickly put together a GeoServer to serve some shape files, but if you're planning to serve petabytes of data, you can't expect to, I mean, get the binary from the web and be able to do that without a little bit of planning, okay? Not enough hardware resources. I mean, my laptop has eight cores and 16 gig of memory. Most of the times I've seen someone struggling with performances, they have like two cores and four gigs of memory. Uh, well, you can't expect a server that is like four times smaller than your laptop to serve hundreds of users, usually without caching. Data is not optimized. Uh, as we said before, before talking about clustering, performance, etc., you need to optimize the data, optimize the styling, make sure you also optimize your server, do the base homework. Clustering is not going to give you performance per se. Clustering is going to give you scalability. If you didn't optimize your data, if you didn't uh, tune your GeoServer configuration, clustering will not help you, okay? Actually, in, in most cases, in some cases, but in most cases, I would say it will make things worse. It won't make things easier. I mean, an example, if your database is not properly configured and your queries are slow, and you don't have enough CPUs in your RTS on AWS, you start clustering GeoServer, performance will be even worse and scalability will not be there. Because I mean, if you have a bottleneck and you put more things on top, because your bottleneck in that case will be the database, the situation will not be better. We actually got worse. So it might seem counterintuitive, but it's the way it is. When you start clustering here, you need to have squeezed all the performance you could have squeezed out of GeoServer, which means data styling, tuning, as well as on whatever is behind GeoServer, the database, the file system. If you are IO bound, I mean, putting more GeoServer on top of the data, on top of the file system will not help again, okay? And then sometimes there are just wrong expectation. I see people that are trying to throw 100 million points on a map and expecting a relatively small geo server to, to render this quickly. I mean, again, it's a wrong expectation. Even because when you compare, for example, geo server with quantum GIS, geo server is a server side application. So it's supposed to work, as we say, at scale in streaming fashion. So trying to serve as many requests as, as possible in parallel with decent performances, not devoting all the resources to a single thread. Keep that into account as well. For example, when you compare with quantum GIS desktop or RGIS that desktop, etc., it's not a single person sitting in front of GeoServer. So we don't try to load everything in memory at once or using 100 threads for a single request. We try to stream as, as uh, fairly as possible. Be careful with what I said before, creating too many layers, try to structure your data correctly in GeoServer. If you don't have a way around this, try to shard your data with multiple GeoServer instances. We'll see an example in a minute. You need to have a test or QA environment. I mean, many clients, they actually think they don't need it, but it's super important because this is one of the things that bite you when you have a problem and you don't know how to replicate. Nobody wants to put the ends, that ends in production. You need to have some sort of monitoring for sure, but also metering or logging and or logging in order to understand what happened when something bad happens. Because if someone is using your services, sooner or later, something bad 
will happen, I mean, you need to be prepared. It's not about hoping it will not happen, it's about being prepared. Caching is an important part of um, geospatial services, especially with maps. So you need to make sure you can cache one way or the other. Remember what I said about real time. And as we said before, I don't know why, but people think the Geo server needs a lot of memory. So by default, people use op memory optimized instances, but it's actually the opposite. Most part of the time when data is optimized, it's CPU, the number one bottleneck. So if you can, you need to go for compute optimized instances. Okay, some real world use cases. I described the first one, Alessandro, and then I'll let you describe the other, okay? So this is actually an interesting example. Uh, we started to work, it actually happened two or three times. We worked with clients that were uh, publishing uh, earth observation data and drones data. So they were simply, uh, they had data pipelines, but the data pipelines, instead of using image mosaic and single table approach, as we said before, they were simply creating new layers for each new acquisition and the related products. So after a few years, these clients ended up with millions of layers. So GeoServer was taking a huge time to start and it was using quite some memory just for keeping the configuration in memory, as we said in the internal catalog. Unfortunately, restructuring data, restructuring the GeoServer layer wasn't possible because the clients were used to work in a certain way. So we would have required to rewrite also the clients. Unfortunately, there wasn't a lot that we could do although we said that the good approach would have been mosaicing and, uh, and single table. So what we did in order to help them and mitigate was one thing which is important, for example, partitioning using virtual services. This helps reduce uh, the size of the CAC capabilities documents, because when you have these many layers, the CAC capabilities document can become 200 megabytes. And I mean, good luck with RGS desktop reading a 200 megabyte XML file for a get capabilities, okay? This helped already for some of the clients. In order to reduce loading time, now I'll go back Alessandro. In order to reduce loading times and memory usage, we sharded the geo server instances. So we decided to shard the layers based on the time, okay? So they have multiple Geo servers, which are not identical, so it's not a pure cluster, but they serve different portions of the same data. They have an application load balancer in front. Okay, this helped a lot, and to a certain extent, it's also interesting because scaling and clustering the shard, the oldest shard, it's very easy because the configuration is never going to change because you don't add data any longer. Okay, clustering the last shard. It's the fun stuff because data keep changing, okay? That's where you might require active clustering. Go ahead. So this is basically what I'm talking about. Um, this is like sharding database in PostGIS or Oracle as I was talking about before. It's a common practice when you have a large amount of data. Can you go ahead, Alessandro? Do you want to, to move on with the others, Alessandro? Yeah, sure. I'll try to answer some of the questions meanwhile. Okay, so this is another um, um, real world use case. It's um, data as a service, highly available infrastructure that we have designed for an Italian utility company. We kept in mind all of the things that we, we've said above in order to, to set up a, a highly um, available infrastructure. Some of the uh, notable things about uh, this infrastructure are um, it's a hybrid GIS infrastructure. So you can see there's a data generation um, um, area here uh, at the right where uh, data is, is coming in from um, uh, is produced by, by ArcGIS and on ArcSDE. Uh, is fetched by and processed by an ETL and it's put into PostgreSQL. And then it's up to the GeoServer cluster to, to serve these, this data to, to the end users. You can see it's uh, highly available. We have um, 
multiple load balancers. We have uh, a JSON cluster. We also have a redundant uh, web application here. Um, some other things uh, notable of this infrastructure is the Q and A um, and production. Uh, environments. So we have two different environments that we use to validate the data before it's ported over to the production. Everything is automated using Jenkins, uh, Jenkins pipelines specifically. And um, we version the just have a configuration over in a GitHub uh, repository so that we keep track of um, configuration changes. Uh, this is not um, uh, an elastic infrastructure, so it's not uh, dynamic. There's no real uh, scaling in and out. It's hosted on uh, VMware, so it's virtual machine based. If you want to scale out your GSV cluster, for instance, you can, uh, but you have to manually sp uh, spin up a new, a new virtual machine. Um, other notable things, uh, monitoring and uh, metering and analytics is in place. We use an ELK stack for that. Uh, maybe it's going to be a topic for another webinar on how we actually implement analytics for GeoServer using an ELK stack. And uh, yeah, that's, let's see. So as we said, highly available, um, automation in place. We have the ETL and it's an hybrid GIS. The configuration as code thing is interesting, Alessandro, apart from the hybrid GIS. So we are treating in this case configuration as code because it's the main thing for them that they change and it needs to be uh, quality assured because before it reach production, because there are business decisions uh, based on the data that we are, uh, the data and the configuration that we are uh, uh, we are promoting configuration mainly means new layers and styling. Okay, so that's the important thing. Apart from the hybrid GIS infrastructure, because data production is done in our GIS desktop still. Okay, other examples of um, data as a service uh, with, with real time data ingestion. So it, that's like a common pattern for many scenarios. Uh, publishing of Earth observation time series, drone data time series, uh, sensor time series, um, METOC or uh, atmospheric modeling, and, uh, and others. So they all have um, these um, common things, and um, you can leverage um, image mosaics with uh, with time dimension, for instance, or uh, uh, SQL views in GeoServer to handle um, the the time available for in your data, the time dimension in your data. In these kind of setups, these kind of systems, uh, the data is rarely modified. It is almost um, uh, never modified, actually. Uh, configuration of the data, I would say. Yeah, a configuration of the data. So it, in terms of just have a configuration and yeah. uh, it, it's well, uh, the the passive, passive cluster um, setup that we talked about before. Uh, but data itself uh, is also rarely modified and um, you usually add data to the system. So if you if you think about uh, I don't know uh, satellite acquired uh, image, it's unless there was an error, a mistake, or, or an error, it's not going to to change once it's ingested in the system. We're just going to add more satellite imagery as we as time passes, basically, and it's similar in other in other scenarios as well, like uh, weather forecasts, for instance. Data is eventually removed at some time in the, sometime in the future, but it's not uh, frequently updated. And that fits well uh, a caching scenario. So it, it's um, 
uh, a good fit for, for, for caching, a good can candidate for caching. So when you have uh, data coming in um, over time in, in, in a flow uh, with this time dimension, you can handle it uh, using uh, an image mosaic in your server. So you definitely don't want to create a new layer in your server for every uh, data bit that is ingested, every granule that is ingested. Um, image mosaic, as we said before, can help you out with that. Um, and you can have an image mosaic with a, with a time dimension to handle uh, multiple times available in your data. Um, you should definitely put the index of your mosaics in a DBMS. By default, your server is going to store it in a, in a shape file. It's, it's not recommended. It's uh, uh, not going to be performant as you, as you add more data to your, to your mosaic. Data should be stored in a, in a shared storage uh, to be accessible by the other instances of your cluster, uh, especially, of course, if it's a distributed cluster, so if it's uh, deployed on multiple nodes. And uh, most importantly, in these scenarios, data can be published continuously without making configuration changes. So adding uh, data to, um, to the system is not a configuration change. You don't need to reload your catalog. You don't need uh, an active cluster, as we said, and so on. You just add data to the mosaic and it becomes available. Uh, you can easily scale it out in terms of how much data you have in, in the system without uh, big performance hits. As long as you store the data in shared storage and you store your index in a DBMS, you're able to scale out the cluster without any problem. So you can add more user instances and it will work fine. Another um, uh, approach that you can use for uh, vector data. So as you, if you ingest vector data over time and you have um, a big data set, you can leverage the parametric SQL view feature in your server. We should probably add the link to the documentation here somewhere for reference, um, where you can um, access uh, data in your DBMS based on a, on a parameter, similarly to what you do in, uh, in a mosaic with a time, time parameter. This scales uh, very well and you can uh, ingest data continuously in, in the DBMS without configuration changes as you do with uh, image mosaics. So again, you don't need to have a new layer every time you ingest new, um, new vector data. You just, um, you just use uh, parametric SQL views. So Alessandro, just, just one comment. So we were supposed to be one hour and a half, but we're already there. We're going to extend the time a little bit. So I think we're going to go, you know, about 20 minutes more or so for those of you that are still here. We, we still have about 10 slides to go and maybe, you know, more questions. So thank you, Alessandro. Thank you. Another use case, precision farming. Um, here we have um, an example of a, of, of a cloud setup. We're leveraging specifically an Azure, um, an Azure setup. We're leveraging Azure FileShare for uh, raster data, uh, just of a configuration and um, uh, tile cache. And we're using uh, uh, PostgreSQL as a service basically from Azure to store um, uh, spatial data and, and mosaic indexes. We're also using the Kubernetes um, as a service provided by, uh, by Azure. And you can see that um, we've deployed GeoServer using Kubernetes deployments. Um, it works uh, fine, as we said before, no problem with using containers with GeoServer. And it can be scaled uh, dynamically at will. So again, um, 
for this kind of use case, you use uh, image mosaics and parametric views to handle um, ingested data uh, over time. A passive cluster fits well this uh, scenario because configuration hardly ever changes. You add more data to your, um, you ingest more data in your mosaic and uh, you add more data in the DB where you don't need to reload the GeoServer configuration. In this specific use case, we uh, kept the configuration in the Docker image. So we burned the, co the configuration of GeoServer in the Docker image itself, and it becomes uh, immutable. So you're not allowed to change the configuration of the slaves um, at runtime. There are lots of um, monitoring options available, of course, if you use a cloud provider, uh, and uh, Kubernetes, uh, for instance, you can use Prometheus to monitor, monitor your pods and, and deployments and uh, uh, centralize um, way of looking at um, your infrastructure. Here we have um, another use case. Uh, it's uh, ship uh, positions in a service for maritime security. In this example, we have, um, it's not a Dockerized setup, so we have virtual machines, we have um, multiple environments. So we have test, pre-prod and prod, as you can see. Um, we're using uh, Jenkins to manage all the automation. So the promotion of the configuration of the cluster from the back office to the slaves and from one environment to the other. And we are versioning uh, the configuration in GitLab, similarly to what we mentioned before in the other use, uh, use case. Another interesting thing about this setup is that we use um, Puppet to uh, have a repeatable uh, infrastructure. So we, we're using Puppet to spin up uh, and set up and configure all the instances in, in this uh, environment. Again, ship positions are updated continuously uh, and the configuration changes are infrequent. So that's a common pattern. Uh, you don't uh, usually need active clustering in these cases. Uh, the configuration hardly ever changes. In this scenario, uh, tight caching doesn't fit well. So contrary to what we, we said before for uh, Earth observation, for instance, and other scenarios, uh, ship positions are changing continuously. Yep. So this is, uh, this well. is where uh, it's one of the few cases where real time is actually real time because you want to see the ships moving. You don't want to, to wait. And uh, if you think about it, there are around, around uh, between 80,000 and 100,000 ships at sea in any moment in the world that are big enough to be monitored, okay? There, are, uh, uh, there is with this thing called AIS, Automatic Identification System, that ships larger than a certain size need to have is an anti-collision system, but it's also used as a monitoring system, actually tracking system. And, uh, they actually emit continuously their position and the rate at which they emit depends on the speed and uh, direction. So if they move quickly, well, depends on the ship, they send position more frequently. More frequently. If they are turning, for example, in a port or anything, they send that position more quickly because being an anti-collision, obviously, when you move, you need to let the other know where you are. And but therefore, this system is ingesting uh, thousands of position per seconds. And uh, again, it's used to monitor activities at sea. So you can't wait too much time to see the changes on this. D data is changing continuously. But again, the configuration is not. I mean, think about it. You need to have, for example, the styling of the visualization can change at random because people from multiple countries are looking at these things from multiple organizations. So. There is actually a lot of discussion in order to make a ship as a triangle or a circle, if you know what I mean, because it needs to be recognizable. Yeah, go ahead, Alessandro. Okay, 
another use case, uh, geological data. Uh, this is uh, another cloud-based deployment. Uh, yeah, it's AWS-based, I believe. Yeah, AWS. Uh, it's not, not Azure this time. Again, we're using Kubernetes uh, as a service uh, provided by, by AWS and a slew of other services. We're using a EBS to store uh, logs and audits. That's something we, we didn't mention before. We like um, the writing performance of, of the data store that you're using for logs and audits to be, to be acceptable or good uh, because GeoServer is quite verbose and it logs a lot to file and uh, you don't want your server to be waiting on IO to write things to the log files. Okay, so it needs to be decent in terms of performance. Uh, we're using EFS, which is basically a network file system to store the GeoServer data there so that it's available to all the GeoServer instances, as well as for uh, raster data. And again, uh, an object storage as three for cache tiles. Databases are storing uh, spatial data. PostgreSQL is storing spatial data, and we have users uh, authentication or author uh, authorization configuration stored in um, SQL Server. Uh, the uh, Kubernetes deployment it's, itself is similar to what you we looked at before. So it's a um, uh, deployment for the master and deployment for the slave. So I'm not going to get into the details of that. What the system is used for, the insights and analysis of geological data. Um, here again, we're using image mosaic with time dimension and SQL views for geological eras. So that's a bit different uh, to what we were looking at before. Here we're using the time dimension for eras uh, over time. Uh, it's again a passive cluster. Um, there are monthly scheduled uh, deployment where the client is updating configuration uh, and as well as data. Um, that's done uh, completely in a, in a completely automated way, again, using uh, Jenkins as well as in part uh, GitLab pipelines. Here I wanted to show you how we uh, do the metering and analytics because we said we sh you should do it, uh, but we didn't mention how you should do it. Uh, we didn't show it to you. Uh, we're using the Elk uh, stack, so Elasticsearch, um, Logstash, and uh, Kibana to create nice dashboards um, with information about the GeoServer performance as well as uh, user analytics. So um, where the, the requests are coming from, what are the most popular layers and so on. And you can see here, the average response time uh, is about 100 milliseconds. So it's quite good. And we, we're counting uh, both cached requests and non-cached requests. So that's the kind of, uh, it's kind of performing uh, well. Okay, last use case, Earth observation uh, data dissemination. Um, this is not a client of ours. There's a continuous data flow of vector and raster data. You wanted to say that the, the, the front end application is not built by us. Yeah, yeah, that's right. We didn't, we didn't uh, implement it ourselves. Uh, we, we took care of implementing the uh, all, all, all the back end, the gist of a cluster behind it, basically. And again, uh, Kubernetes based deployment, if they're more and more becoming more and more popular every day. Um, there are few things um, notable in this setup is uh, we use the a PostgreSQL uh, operator in Kubernetes implemented by Zalando to scale our Postgres cluster. So we have um, a master and a replica PostgreSQL uh, instances. And we, we, we use, we target the, the, the 
the master instance for uh, ingestion and you can target decide to, to target your replicas for uh, data serving this is a good fit for caching as we said before data is not changing over time uh, after a given amount of time cache tiles can be removed usually only the the most recent data is interesting to the end user uh, especially if you think about uh, uh, weather for forecasts for instance uh, almost no one is looking at uh, archives i shouldn't say almost no one but a uh, few people are looking at old archive of uh, forecast uh, predictions uh, weather predictions they only usually look at the the most recent data so after some time you just prune the cache uh, to avoid bloating it with unused uh, data. Configuration changes again are infrequent. We just ingest data. Uh, data growth needs to be handled. And uh, we said already we're using um, a PostgreSQL operator to scale uh, the Postgres cluster. Tips and tricks. Um, Auto scaling and resource usage. Uh, the most important resource, as we said, to monitor is uh, the CPU. GeoServer is CPU in in intensive. You should keep track of memory in case you run out of memory in your uh, in your nodes or in your instance. It's uh, completely fine to, for your CPU to spike to 100% for small. Uh, uh, amounts of time for small bursts. Uh, if it's running at 100%, uh, it typically means that there are no other bottlenecks in your infrastructure. So it's usually a good sign. Uh, of course, if it's stuck at 100% all the time, that's not a good sign. Uh, you should definitely use control flow to protect your cluster in production, and you should tune it properly to achieve uh, maximum resource usage. Um, okay. Conclusions. So we, we're wrapping up the, uh, the presentation of the webinar. Strength and limitations, you should definitely study your data in advance and the user interactions. So what kind of applications uh, you're going to use to access the infrastructure, uh, what data they're looking at, and so on. You should prepare a, a plan for your deployment based on what we have said today. Uh, and you should look for um, strengths and weaknesses of GeoServer for your uh, specific use case. So you should have some sort of uh, development environment to test things out and, and, and measure the performance uh, before moving on uh, to production. Always remember to optimize your data. Uh, that makes a huge difference. And uh, keep it as uh, simple as possible. As we said, uh, most scenarios don't require active clustering. So you should be fine just by using um, a passive clustering setup. And remember to monitor and meter everything. Use uh, whatever tools you have available to monitor the infrastructure, um, your uh, GeoServer instances, and you should, if you can, um, use GeoServer audit logging to, to uh, get some insights on the performance of a GeoServer cluster as we as we were showing before uh, in the Eric Stack example. I think that's it for the presentation. So Alessandro, if... uh, sorry. Yeah, go ahead. No, th thank you very much. Thank you, Simone. So we have time for more questions a little bit, but before that, I appreciate it. Those of you that are still here can please provide answer to the poll that I just launched. It will give us good feedback about 
how we can improve and where you are in terms of your, your server cluster. So we really appreciate, you know, that, that information from you. It's only four questions, so it will take you less than a minute. Um, I think, uh, let me see, we still have one question open. Um, so Alessandro, you want to ask to respond to that one? Yeah, I think, um, okay, I'm checking the, the questions. Um, Any other configuration guidelines, minimum requirements, CPU and RAM? Yes, uh, of course, uh, every, every setup is a little bit different and you need to study uh, your data set and so on. Um, base minimum requirements, I would say at the very least two CPU cores and four gigabytes of RAM for a, a G server instance. For uh, your use case, I see. Okay, can I, can I answer? Can I give a quick answer, Alessandro? Yeah. Well, in reality, George, uh, I mean, this is not, uh, let's say, from what I'm saying, is not, let's say, a very demanding setup per se. It depends a little bit on the number of users because if the GOT are optimized, I mean, four gigabytes is peanuts, it's not big. Uh, for Geo server. Well, we need to see if it's float or double or RGB or 16 bits, but I mean, on average, four gigs nowadays is, is not big at all. I don't know if these are image mosaics or uh, actually we should have pressed uh, respond. Sorry. <laughs> I'll do that. Okay, I'll restart. Uh, well, again, as I said, uh, I don't see anything, let's say, particularly requiring per se. Uh, the one thing uh, you said this is a mosaic. So when it's a mosaic, you will need for sure to take into account that you can't expect GeoServer to put together a thousand GeoTIFF at all scales. So you will need to put scaling limitation in the style or you to revert to a pyramid. This is not GeoServer specific. It's, I mean, for every software serving data uh, like this, you can't expect you server to open 100,000 GeoTIFF to create a 256 by 256 tiles. That said, assuming the GeoTIFF has been optimized and assuming you're showing them at a decent scale, uh, you're not going to use a lot of uh, CPUs. I mean, I would start simple with the usual four cores and eight gigs. The difference is made by the number of users you want to serve. If you have one user, then I mean, those CPUs and, and, and HIP might be enough. If you have uh, a thousand users, concurrent users, then I mean, you need to scale up. Let's put it, uh, let's put it like that. If we're talking about every mass tiled request and so on, a properly configured uh, geo server in terms of data and uh, JVM options with four cores at decent speed, not low end uh, CPUs, and uh, two to four gigs of HIP can generate 256 by 256 tiles as JPEG, especially if you use libjpeg turbo, there is a free extension for GeoServer to use that, up to 50 to 60 requests per seconds with decent speed, like a few hundred milliseconds. So this is already pretty good. If you think that a single user can send you, for example, with a web client up to six requests in parallel, so this means you can already serve a decent number of users. I hope this helps, George. It's usually very difficult to give better numbers because it depends on a number of factors, as I said, uh, the data, the hardware, the users. Uh, it's, it's not as simple, but I try to give you a, a reference, okay? Welcome. Okay, so I see we don't have any more questions. And I see most of you have replied to the poll. Still, you know, there are like 10 people that haven't. So if you can please finish um, answering. That will be great for us. So I think we can, we can close. Um, anything else, Simone or Alessandro? Uh, 
just one quick thing. As we said, we'll do other webinars. We want to do one specifically for the active clustering, and we might do for sure one on, the, let's say, monitoring and measuring uh, geo server in production. So we have been doing some work for a client lately on uh, measuring uh, performance uh, for WMS, WCS, WPS. I mean, it's been a nightmare, but we might try to put up a webinar for that. We need to discuss if we can release the, the Gemeter plans, because I mean, if we had to redo that work, <laughs> it's going to be too much work for a free webinar. Super, well, so uh, with that, I'd like to, to thank everybody that joined and stayed for almost the two hours. And I hope to, we hope to see you in the next webinar and other meetings like the FedGeo Day, which we're going to be part in about two weeks, the Force 4G meetings, Geo Int. So I hope to, to see some of you virtually or now maybe in person. So all you take a lot of care. Cheers. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.